Hi, and welcome to today's little quickie. Today we're going to be looking at how I modified this round column mill to make it a little easier to use. We're also going to be looking at head alignment. Now the heads on these machines have no angular adjustment. And if we're out of square, well, we can, or we have no choice but to, shim the column on the machine. And we'll be taking a look at that. But before we look at all of that, I'd like to attract your attention to what I've set up here on the table of the mill. This is a universal scribe set that I've received from a friend of mine in Greece, Dimitri. His YouTube channel is Jimmy's Canal. And he produces these uh, in a very artistic way. Now, I don't need to talk about this universal scribe pen any more than that, because if you want more details, well, you can go and see three videos on Dimitri's YouTube channel and learn really everything you want to know about it. But I do not, as a rule, promote products in my videos. So why am I doing it now? Well, there's two reasons. The first is, well, Dimitri hit a home run here. This is beautifully designed, beautifully machined, and beautifully packaged. It's a class act all the way. And that really isn't important. I mean, no reason there to promote it. But the second reason is what really motivates this, and that is that Jimmy is just starting out in the tool making business. And if there's one thing that I love to do, and that I did throughout all my teaching career, well that is helping out beginners. And that is why I'm talking about it here. So if you have a few minutes, or if you're interested, go and check out his channel. It's pretty amazing stuff. For us, well, let's get back to our mill mods. I've received a few questions about quill and spindle lubrication. If you lower the quill to its bottom point, well, you can access the bottom portion. And to access the top, just remove this cover. Now, the spindle itself has sealed the bearings and they're best left alone. Now, the quill has a rack gear on the back of it. And if you lower the quill to its lowest point, well, you can lubricate the rack by applying a small amount of grease. The next thing I want to look at is this spindle or quill lock. These double wedge locks are often grabby and gummy. They're, they're not pleasant to work with. And the handle rarely sits when it's locked in a comfortable position. What I did to solve the problem, well, is quite simple. I did two things. First, I added a spring between the two halves of the spindle lock, and I added some shims to back the handle up. The spring does two things here. First is to maintain an outward pressure on the two half locks of the spindle. This permits a lot more control because when I loosen off the locking handle, well, the two halves separate from the spindle quickly. The spring also maintains a certain pressure on the handle, stopping the handle from turning automatically to its lowest point as soon as the spindle is unlocked. I guess you could say that the spring is kind of like Viagra for your handle, because it helps to keep it up. The spacers are there, well, to position the handle properly, well, or if you prefer to position it for proper use. If your handle is always sticking out towards the back of the machine when you're trying to lock or unlock it, it's very uncomfortable to use. So you can just use the spacers required so that your handle locks in a forward position comfortable to work with. Now, you see here that I'm using a washer and an oversized hex nut. That's not because you have to do that. You could actually turn or produce a proper spacer. I'm just a little too lazy. Well, there you go. The spring and spacers give me easy and safe access to the handle, as well as increasing my control. 
Another problem with these machines is backlash in the quill. When we're using a knee mill, something like a bridge port, well, we feed the table up into the tool for milling operations. And that's great because we're feeding against the tool, which it's bearing down on the part, and that means that there's no backlash issues with that vertical movement. On this machine, that is not the case. We're using the quill to feed, in Z, and that is the same direction that we're forcing against the part. And that means that I do have backlash issues. And when I've taken one cut and want to readjust my depth and unlock my spindle, well, if I unlock the spindle completely, kachink, the spindle or the quill moves, and I lose all my references on my graduated collar. And that is problematic. You can work around it but it really gets on my nerves. So what we're going to do here, and it's the simplest solution, is to set up a DRO on the quill. But not just any DRO, a poor man's DRO. So we're going to be setting up a 6 inch vernier caliper that I acquired for the majestic sum of $18. And it's not just a poor man's DRO we're going to be setting up here, it's a cheap poor man's DRO. Because once I'm done here, that vernier caliper will still be usable as a vernier caliper. It won't be permanently mounted on the machine. So, let's take a look at that. We start by modifying the head casting and the spindle casting. We want to produce here two flat surfaces that are going to be parallel and perpendicular to the table. The parts that are being modified here are made of grey cast iron and that material can be readily filed. Just be very attentive to what you're doing. The perpendicularity of the surfaces can be checked by using an accurate square projecting from the surface of the table. And you can use a dial indicator mounted on the table of the machine to verify that the surfaces are parallel to the x-axis of the machine. Once that is complete, you can lay out two lines. It's important here that the lines be perpendicular to the table, and you can use your square for that, and that they align one to the other, even though they are in two different planes. I mean by that, that one sticks out a little more than the other. Now we can prick punch and center punch our whole locations in the Z axis. Now, their position is not crucial here. Anywhere height-wise will do. Just don't get close to an edge. Remember, this is gray cast iron. And then, using a guide block, a guide block is any piece of mild steel that is good and square that you drill a hole through, uh, the same size as the hole that you want to produce in your part and then you can hold the block up to the part to ensure that you're penetrating the part perpendicular to the surface that you're drilling. Then drill the two holes and then using a tap block to guide your tap, tap the holes. In this case I'm using a quarter twenty tap. Now. Note that the holes are offset to the left side of the casting, and I did that in order to avoid the depth stop bore. Then on the lathe, I produced these two brass cylinders. Now, they're threaded on each end, one end a quarter twenty, the other end a ten thirty-two, and I've inserted into those threads uh, some threaded rods which were cut to length. Note that I've produced the brass cylinders at two different lengths, and that is in order to compensate for the fact that the uh, flat surfaces that I've produced are not in the same plane. Also note that the brass cylinders are a lot longer than what they would seem to need to be, and that is, well, in order to clear the plastic cowling once it's reassembled on the casting. I can now turn my attention to the vernier calipers, the cheap vernier calipers. And the first thing we want to do, well, is to lay out two hole positions. The X and Y coordinates for the positioning of these holes is not crucial, but the holes do have to be positioned evenly on one side and the other of the caliper. 
then you're going to center punch the whole locations. The part here is quite hard, so you could schmuck up your center punch a few times and have to resharpen it. But in any case, wear your safety glasses. Remember, your eyes are only about as puncture resistant as a ripe tomato. We can then move on to the drilling. I'm using here a center drill. Now, the material that most calipers are made from is extremely prone to work hardening. So you want to avoid any kind of rubbing of the tool here. So use a lower than usual RPM and a lot of cutting pressure. If, however, you do rub and it does work harden, well, your best bet will be a diamond cutter in a Dremel tool to finish the job. Now, the holes that we want to produce here in the calipers, well, are just a very slight clearance for a 1032 thread. A male 1032 external thread has a maximum OD of 190 thou. So I suggest you use a number 5 center drill and that will give you a hole that's about 188 thousandths of an inch. And should that turn out to be just a little too snug, you can use a diamond grit Dremel tool to just slightly clean out the hole. We can then mount the calipers onto the studs and tighten it down using some wing nuts. Now, if you want to get fancy, you could make yourself some really nice brass thumb nuts. But hey, I'm way too lazy for that. Now, if we look at it sideways with the cowling reassembled, well, we can see a lot of crap at the back of the shop. But other than that, we can see that we just barely clear the mounting screws of the cowling. And that is why we produce those cylinders, those brass cylinders, a little longer than what seemed to be necessary. So let's take this mod for a test drive. With the backlash taken care of, I set the graduated collar to zero. We can now set the calipers to zero. I guess we can call them now a DRO and feed downwards one full turn, or if you prefer, a hundred thousandths of an inch. And there you go, 99 thousandths of an inch, which is great because the scale on the graduated collar really isn't very accurate. One last thing about this poor man's DRO is I'm gonna be moving around a lot here with my hands and my arms uh, to do different jobs. And the tips of these inside measuring surfaces, well, they are quite sharp. So I took a stone and just rounded them off so that they won't be sharp. Now, it'll still be painful if I really hook them hard, but it won't open my arm. And that, well, it's important. So. Another problem we have with these mills that I get a lot of questions about is my spindle isn't square to the table and can we do something about it? Well the answer is yes. Now there is no adjustment on the head for pitch or yaw but the column itself can be shimmed. It's held on to the base with four bolts and well I can shim to get this position properly. Now there's something that's important to say here. We want to get our spindle perpendicular to the table and if we were living in a perfect world well the spindle would be perfectly parallel with the column. But that's not always the case. Sometimes the error is in the base of the column and sometimes the error is between the spindle and the column. Regardless of where the error is, we can correct it by shimming the base of the column and get our spindle perpendicular. But if there is a discrepancy between the parallelism of the spindle and the column, one thing needs to be known. That is that if I move the head around the column, uh, I won't be perpendicular anymore. If both are parallel and I shim the base of the column to bring myself perpendicular, well, I can spin around the column as much as I want. 
I won't get any uh, out of perpendicularity because of that problem, because of that movement. So, if you do have a spindle that's not perfectly aligned with your column, well, just make sure that you're always about in the same spot to not get too much out of square. That being said, my machine here, well, it was, and I've undid what I already did because I adjusted it when I bought it, but it was good side per side. So from one side to the other, this direction, everything was fine. I was well within a few ten thousandths of an inch. Front to back, however, that was another can of beans. I was about three and a half, four thou out and I shimmed the column. So let's take a look at that. I'm going to, for this, be using some shim stock that I'll use for permanently uh, shimming the base. But before we permanently shim, I'm going to use a feeler gauges to find what thickness I need. The first thing that needs to be said here is that you must not remove the four bolts that hold the column to the base. Only loosen them slightly, just enough to get your shims in place. If you do remove the screws, knowing that the head is not balanced, well, obviously, it will fall off. After some trial and error, in other words, after trying different shim thicknesses, snugging the column down each time and sweeping the table with a dial indicator, I've come to the conclusion that a three thousandths of an inch thick shim just overcompensates slightly for the problem. And I want to overcompensate here slightly because that will help me to easily insert the permanent shim between the column and the base. Now, if three thousandths was a little much, well, two thousandths of an inch should do just fine. So I'm going to make myself two permanent two thousandths of an inch thick shims. I start by snipping the parts that I need, so this is going to become two shorter shims. And important here, you want to burnish the edges, because obviously those tin snips kicked up a burr. Then you want to loosen the screws on one side of the column and insert your permanent shim. After which, well, you can pull the temporary shim out. Now start the same operation over again on the other side of the column. Then you can snug down that second side well, maybe a little more than snug, and come back to the first side and tighten down permanently. Then do the same on the second side. And there you go. Our head is nice and square. Another thing that's important on these machines is hard stops, or machine zeros if you want. And my x-axis has two that I can adjust. And you can position these along the x-axis as you wish. And those x-axis hard stops can be limits for a pocket, yes. But more often than not, I set them up to be hard zeros. And that means a zero I can come back to should I get lost with my movements in the x-axis and know that where that is. That hard stop is X number of inches or centimeters or millimeters from my part reference zero. But there is no hard stop on this machine in the Y axis. So I've set one up. Let's move in a little closer and take a look at that. Here we have an oversized washer. It's quite thick that I've cut off about one third of the way down. I've drilled and tapped a hole in the casting that acts as a pivot that I can pivot around, position my oversized washer so that it comes in interference and that gives me something that I can lean up to to find a zero 
uh, if ever I get lost while I'm producing my part. Well, I had a great time producing this video and I hope it helps out. Now we have other videos on the subject of round column mills, a couple of little quickies, uh, round column mill part one and part two, and we also have several projects where we use this machine, as well as a little quickie about positioning holes accurately when your machine doesn't have a digital readout, in this case in X and Y, because I have a digital readout in Z now. I've had a lot of fun producing this video. I hadn't produced one for quite some time. And it's important to have fun. It's important for you to have fun as well. So, have fun. But be safe. It's so important. And happy machining.